everyone. Welcome to the January 4th edition of the Timeform US Pacecast. I'm David Aragona, and I'm happy to report that my usual co-host, Craig Mulkowski, is back in the co-host seat today. Craig, I know that we missed you the past few weeks, had some guests on for the handicapping, did a little bit of recapping, um, but uh, we've been missing you for about a month now. Happy that you had some time off to refresh, but glad to have you back for the start of the new year. Yeah, it's always an exciting time in racing. I will appreciate. I will admit, I appreciated having the time away from racing. I still caught the odd race here and there. Uh, of course, I, I saw the flight line race that everybody was talking about. I even tuned in to watch that one uh, live while I was at an Oklahoma City Thunder game. It was being run at the same time, so I I did catch that one. But yeah, it's good to to take a break every now and then, both from work, of course, but also from betting. I. I Don't think I've made a bet in three weeks, so I look forward to getting back into it, uh, both doing this show and uh, the forecast on Fridays. No, I think we both know that well. Sometimes in this game of horse racing, it just gets relentless coming at you every weekend, every week, every day, and it really is worthwhile to take those breaks at times and just allow your brain to refresh, come back in with, uh, you know, your uh, energy uh, restored. So good good to have all that uh, going in your favor for the start of the new year. And Craig, before we get into some of this racing that happened on New Year's Day and this past weekend, let's first take a look back at uh, 2021. Talk about some Eclipse Awards. Uh, I know that we're both Eclipse Award voters. Our ballots will be due in about, I think, six days time as we record this on Tuesday of this week. Uh, but uh, some of the categories are pretty straightforward. Some of them, uh, I think, are still up for debate. Not really a lot of resolution coming out of 2021. I did have uh, uh, the Daily Racing Forum California handicapper Brad Freon a couple weeks ago, and we talked a little bit about the Eclipse Award situation. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to get your take on a lot of these categories. Craig, I do want to start with one of the most wide open ones, and that's male sprinter. Uh, you mentioned that impressive performance by Flightline, who uh, won the Malibu with that gigantic speed figure. I guess some people might throw some support his way just as the latest new shiny thing in the division, but I think it's hard to argue that he has had a, ch- a championship campaign. Uh, the top contenders, obviously, are Aloha West, Jackie's Warrior, probably Dr. Shival, who Brad said that he was considering voting voting for, even though he had that terrible performance in the Malibu, even Golden Pal, I've seen some chatter about him. How are you viewing that category? Yeah, it's one of the tougher ones. It is one that I I don't, as this guy that makes speed figures, I generally don't rely on speed figures very much when it comes to Eclipse Awards, because I really do think you should focus on the accomplishments of the horses. But when it's this close, I mean, I do use it as kind of one of the factors. And because of that, I'm most likely going to go with Jackie's Warrior. I, I haven't cast my ballot yet. It's something I, I actually thought I was going to have to scramble to do it today because usually they're due a little earlier. But then I saw it's not until next week when you, you let me know about that. So I'll take a little more time. But I, I'm leaning pretty heavily towards Jackie's Warrior. I, I think he ran the best sprint races all year. For whatever reason, he just didn't show up in the Breeders' Cup, but I think he had a really solid resume that that spanned the entire season. Yeah, there are a lot of imperfect champions or likely champions in this Eclipse Awards, and it feels like Jackie's Warrior might be one of them. I do think he's going to win the award. Um, I was trying to find a way to get creative and maybe look for somebody else that was a little bit more deserving, uh, but I just couldn't quite get there myself. I feel like I am going to end up voting for Jackie's Warrior. At the end of the day, even though he never beat older horses, that Alan Jerkins that he won against straight three-year-olds, in my view, was one of the best three, one of the best sprint dirt races that we saw the entire year, regardless of the fact that there weren't older horses competing in it. We've talked about it quite a bit that the three-year-olds were better than the older horses in many of these divisions, and I think this one was no different. So um, I'm not going to hold that against Jackie's Warrior. My philosophy is that I don't want to just default to the Breeders' Cup winner. I think that a lot of voters do that in many different categories. And while Aloha West does have the most important uh, grade one victory on his resume in the Breeders' Cup sprint, that's not my philosophy to just default to horse who was good on one day. So I'm probably going to go with Jackie's Warrior as well. 
The other category in the sprint division that I, I don't think is settled, Craig, is the female sprinter, where you've got two worthy champions in CC who won the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint, beating Gamin, who had a few other grade one victories earlier in the year. Um, Gamin obviously has the stronger overall resume, but she did lose on the big day when she was facing off against her main rival. How are you viewing that one? Yeah, and that one I'm probably going to lean towards CC. I, I wasn't very impressed with Gamin this year. She just didn't seem the same horse. And though she did win a couple of races, there wasn't a lot of competition in there. And I just thought CC had a little bit better campaign. And this is one where I think the Breeders' Cup was pretty decisive. She was able to beat her handily. And, and what I viewed it as one that was probably a toss-up coming in and depended on the outcome of that race. I'm going to lean towards the winner. And it's not like she won by a nose. I mean, she beat her very easily, to be honest. So I think it's going to be CC for me. Yeah, this one's close. Um, I know that there are other issues around Gami and her being a Bob Baffert trainee. A lot of people are looking to downgrade her for that reason. Uh, maybe more so the... Uh, social media voters, not the actual Eclipse Award voters. Uh, but yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I feel like CeCe had a solid year coming into the Breeders' Cup. Obviously, she hadn't achieved that grade one victory before the Breeders' Cup, but she had won a couple other graded stakes. She won that Princess Rooney over a Steel Hotel and Toso, the same horse that Gamine beat when she did win the grade one Derby City Distaff earlier in the year. So it feels like her accomplishments are not like a major notch below Gamine's coming in, and she did beat her fair and square on the day. So I, I think CeCe is a deserving champion in a category that I do view as kind of a toss-up. Uh, the both turf categories, I think, are up for debate. We've got female turf, which just seems completely wide open. This is one where I could see a lot of voters defaulting to the Breeders' Cup winner, Loves Only You, who came in from Japan and had a really strong international campaign, both in the U.S., Dubai, Hong Kong. I mean, she's won grade ones on a, a couple of different continents. Uh, but you've got other horses that won multiple grade ones this year. Uh, Santa Barbara, Altica, Warlike Goddess was considered the most talented American for a while this year. Uh, I think it's just a question of whether you want to go for the foreign horse or default towards horses who had more established uh, U.S. campaigns. Yeah, I would say for me, this is probably the toughest call, and, and I really don't have a strong lean at this time. I'll, I'll publish my vote like I always do on Twitter, let people know who I wind up with, but I'm just really not sure. Uh, it's tough for me to vote for a horse like Loves Only You that only ran once here the entire year, but I mean, it's hard to knock what she's done overseas. It, we don't have clear-cut guidelines on how to handle these foreign shippers. You know, what races are supposed to count, what races aren't supposed to count. So really, it's something I'm going to have to think about. It, it wouldn't be more like goddess for me because even though she was good all year, I think she came up pretty short when it counted the most. Some might argue her ride wasn't great that day. But at the end of the day, I'm looking at the result and she, she wasn't able to get the job done. So really not sure and going to have to dig deeper on this one before I commit one way or the other. Yeah, Warlike Goddess, I think if she had won the Breeders' Cup with a better ride, would have been the easy choice in this category, uh, achieving a second grade one. But uh, it's hard to make her a champion based on the resume that's just looking at us in the face. I mean, she has that lone grade one victory in the Flower Bowl against a really suspect field. I mean, I know my sister Nat, who she beat, came back to run okay in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf, finishing second. But uh, yeah, it just doesn't feel like a championship campaign. Altica's got those pair of grade one victories. I think Santa Barbara, um, kind of a, a sentimental choice with us obviously losing her this past year. Um, but, uh, I mean, her grade one victories stand up pretty well in retrospect with her beating uh, Cone Lima, who went on to success in the Belmont Oaks. That was a solid race for the three-year-olds. And then the Beverly D, where she soundly just uh, walloped Mean Mary, who obviously disappeared, but was a good horse for a while there. So... I don't know. Uh, it's a really tough one for me, and I've got to consider it more as well. But it does feel like Love's Only You, just because of that Breeders' Cup sore, is probably the front runner. 
Uh, male turf, uh, equally confusing. I think you could probably narrow this one down to two with uh, Yabir and domestic spending. Obviously, Yabir has those foreign connections and credentials, but he also did win two races in this country, one much more important than the other with him winning the Breeders' Cup turf. And that just might be enough because even though domestic spending has a pair of grade one victories, the fact that he was inactive for most of the second half of the season, I think is going to be a strike against him. Yeah, and that's how I'm looking at that one. I, I'm sure I'm going to go with Yabir in this one. And it's because he won twice. He won the biggest race. And he did so impressively. I mean, that that was a, a really nice win in the Breeders' Cup turf, beating older horses as a three-year-old. So it, it would be hard for me to pick domestic spending over him at, when, like you said, during the most important time of the year, he wasn't around. And the final equine category that we should discuss before moving on uh, is three-year-old male. This one uh, feels like it's down to two horses. Uh, Essential Quality and Medina Spirit, both flawed candidates in different ways. Uh, they both lost the Breeders' Cup Classic to Nick's Go, the older horse. Medina Spirit, obviously, that very tricky situation for a number of reasons with him being trained by Bob Baffert, the Derby positive. Obviously, the unfortunate circumstance of him passing away this past month. Uh, Essential Quality had a solid campaign, if not a spectacular one. I see the argument for both, Craig. I, I think we've talked about this one a little bit before. I'm leaning essential quality. How about you? I'm leaning the same way. And unfortunately, it probably is because, because of the stuff uh, that didn't happen on the racetrack. It would have been really nice if the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission could have made a decision by now. I'm not sure what the heck's happening with that. Uh, maybe we'll find out by 2023. Who knows? But when you compare their resumes, they're just really, really close. First, So for me, the black mark against Medina Spirit uh, of likely being disqualified in the Kentucky Derby is going to be the deciding factor. It does seem, I know it hasn't happened yet, and we have to cast the votes now, but I do think you have to look into the future a little bit. It does seem like it's supposed to be an inevitability that he's eventually disqualified in the Kentucky Derby. We'll see how this thing plays out in the courts when it eventually does, because it feels like it will. Um, but uh, I have to imagine that's going to happen. And if you take that victory off Medina Spirit's resume, it, it does feel like essential quality is the right champion for the year. Uh, Craig, I imagine you haven't looked too deeply at the human categories yet, um, though a few of them do seem like they're fairly cut and dry, at least from my point of view. I think that the strong favorites to win trainer and jockey would be brad cox and joel rosario um brad cox obviously won the award last year joel rosario in the running last year arguably deserving last year but seems like he's really compiled a resume this year all across the country and in the top level graded stakes races that would make him a deserving champion jockey yeah i have no problem those will definitely both be my two picks for the the trainer and jockey and it's not particularly close uh i haven't looked at the others the owner the apprentice but those two i, I have those inked in already so that's a brief look at the eclipse awards as craig said he'll post his ballot when he casts it next week i'll probably do the same i've done that the past few years uh but those are the most controversial categories the others all seem like they're pretty straightforward as many often are by the time you get to the eclipse awards so craig let's transition and talk about some races from the past week as we flip over the calendar to 2022 and let's start with some three-year-old prep races uh we had or i should say kentucky derby prep races very early kentucky derby prep races as all of these uh, four races from Santa Anita, Oaklawn, Aqueduct, and Gulfstream offered points towards the Kentucky Derby. We'll see if those are actual points that matter on the first Saturday in May because I'm not sure we saw the Derby winner in action this past weekend. No uh, crazy high speed figures, but we'll talk about some of these performances. Um, on the time form US scale, Craig, the fastest of these three-year-old preps was the grade three sham out at Santa Anita. Uh, this one uh, just dominated by Bob Baffert. Uh, been a lot of discussion about Baffert's status with regard to the Kentucky Derby and his uh, his trainees being able to accrue points towards that race, but it hasn't stopped the owners from keeping the horses in his care, and uh, he had the exacta here with Newgrange beating Rockefeller. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, Newgrange ran a, an okay race. I, I'm not going to get too carried away with it. He got a 109 time form U.S. speed figure. Final time was a 112, uh, but he had pretty much everything all his own way. All the fractions are coated in blue. The pace was slow with him on a, a clear, pretty easy lead most of the way. 
Um, we have the card coded in red as as highly speed favoring. Uh, I'll be interested to hear your uh, thoughts on that. As I was away, didn't watch the whole card. I, I only saw the stakes races. But the interesting thing about me with Newgrange is that he uh, seems to be overlooked, uh, which is unusual for a Bob Baffert horse. It's not like he's totally overlooked and went off 10 to 1, but I think he was just the second or third choice here. He was only the second choice in his maiden win, and I just found that a little bit odd. Yeah, I mean, I guess Rockefeller was the more fancied Baffert runner coming into this race off that victory at Belmont in the Nashua. Uh, New Grain did have to step up off that one uh, debut victory at Del Mar. Uh, he did so. I wouldn't say that we learned a lot new about New Grange in this race because just the way things played out. Um, the two Bob Baffert runners were the only horses with speed in this race, and it was very apparent that the instructions were not for one to go after the other, and with Newgrange drawing inside of Rockefeller, once John Velasquez was able to secure that half-length margin, Flavie and Pratt really applied no pressure at all on the stablemate Rockefeller, so I think the the break basically decided the outcome of this race, um, and, and Newgrange, he, he got the mile, but as you said, he did it under ideal circumstances, setting that very slow pace, um, um, with a track that I wouldn't say it was intensely speed favoring, but it definitely was not working against front runners. We had uh, some young horses, some debut winners that went gate to wire early in the card, and I think that influences things a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that the top two necessarily improved much on their prior form. They just really had circumstances in their favor. The only horse, though, that's taking, uh, or I should say one of just two horses that's taking derby points out of this race would be OVI Class, who finished third, and he's achieved points before, having also run um, uh, in the uh, American Pharaoh behind Corniche when he was third back in October. Um He's one that I would give another shot to. He was most affected by the pace here, trying to close into it. Um, he's a horse that hasn't gotten the ideal setups a few times. So uh, he's one that I think could do better in the future. But obviously, there was no beating these Baffert runners, given the way it shaped up on the track. Yeah, I guess he's the one you have to keep an eye on. He, he kind of feels like one of those horses that's always going to take money. He got a reputation early. Uh, he ran pretty good. But sooner or later, he's going to get some pace to run into, and we'll find out what he really has. But he hasn't had that in the last few episodes. Seems like the most competitive uh, three-year-old prep this past weekend, at least on the way in, appeared to be the Smarty Jones with that full field drawn to go the mile at Oaklawn. They did have to encounter a sloppy track, um, so trips and handling the surface were uh, variables on this day, but a horse that was able to do both was the winner, Dash Attack, who I thought got a great ride from David Cohen, saving ground the entire way from the rail, and he just seemed to relish the surface, uh, won pretty comfortably in the end by two lengths. Yeah, this was the slowest of all the uh, Derby points races this weekend. He only got a 102 time for him, U.S. speed figure. But I don't get too hung up on those things this early in the year. These are rapidly improving horses. He jumped up eight points from his maiden win. So that's something you want to see. He's two for two. So I'm not going to knock him too much. There was a solid pace in the race, the half miles coded in red, which is often going to happen when you have a big field. So Promising horse. I imagine he'll show up in, in maybe the Rebel next. Uh, we'll see. I doubt he would go to the Southwest too, but hard to say. E either spot, he would probably be a contender. Yeah, it's nice to see Ked McPeak have some live three-year-olds on the Triple Crown Trail. Obviously, looks like his top contender now is that runner uh, Smile Happy, who won the Kentucky Jockey Club. Obviously, he's also two for two in his career, like Dash Attack, but Dash Attack has not uh, won... Or, or, or beat as strong horses as that rival or run it quite as fast. As you said, this was the slowest of the um, preps last weekend, at least from the Time Form US perspective, with the sham getting that 109 Time Form US speed figure being the fast. So not a huge variance, but you want to see these three-year-olds starting to run a little bit faster at this time of the year. Uh, Dash Attack, he's got pedigree to go longer, even though he's by Munnings. Uh, Munnings, a very versatile sire, and the dam, she's a half-sister to a horse named Song of Navarone, who was a very good New Mexico-based dirt router about 10 years ago. So um, d definitely some, uh, some pedigree for this one to go on in distance we'll see what that also how that ultimately develops but uh, a good looking winner of this race i don't have a whole lot to say about the runners in behind um there was a fast pace of this race at least for the opening half mile so maybe that worked against some of the pace setters but i didn't see a ton of excuses in behind now and the thing with these three-year-olds is uh it's one thing to say the pace was fast and it hurt the front runners but 
these races are just going to get longer and longer as we get closer to May. So it kind of counteracts each other, uh, just at least a little bit. Moving on to the uh, Jerome at Aqueduct on Saturday. Another sloppy track, this one going the same distance a mile, but around one turn at Aqueduct. And uh, this one featured an extremely fast pace. If you are watching a lot of the racing at Aqueduct this past weekend, you know that for the entire week, speed was extremely dangerous. There was weather in the area, track conditions were changing, but it seemed like that bias really kind of held on for at least three days, maybe four days even into Sunday, uh, where it was just hard to close. And when the riders start to get wind of that situation they just start to naturally become more aggressive in their rides and you could see that happen in the Jerome as a lot of riders had intentions to get forward and that made for a very fast early pace but credit to Corvassier the winner of this race for surviving it he was up close to the pace the entire way and he was able to hold off some closers yeah he ran a very nice race what's interesting about the the track is it's still on the slow side which is normal for aqueduct only a six on our one to ten scale but it definitely was speed favoring for quite a while and i was impressed with his effort he's a horse who is probably going to like longer distances anyway he broke his maiden at a mile and an eighth around two turns last time out his speed figures moving in the right direction so no knocks on this one at all he got a 105 for the win because of the pace that that was upgraded from the 99 final time figure. So I'd be a little leery of the horses that did some closing in here, like the runner up Martin up the uh, fourth place finisher on bridal bomber, because they kind of had things their own way much more than the winner and the, the third place finisher cook Creek. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting race to analyze. I think a lot of these horses, unlike some other races we're going to talk about, a lot of these horses feel like they are going to stretch out in distance, particularly the winner, some that finished in behind, like Cook Creek and Unbridled Bomber. They feel like horses that do want to go farther than a mile eventually. So we'll see if that works in their favor. Obviously, at Aqueduct in this three-year-old series there, they'll get to go a mile and an eighth in the subsequent prep, the Withers. So that's going to be an interesting one to see who comes back there. And if some new shooters are in that race that maybe have run faster than these Jerome horses, but Cravassier, uh, he's just been improving with every start. He's got a stellar pedigree. Uh, he's by Tappet, the damn Take Charge Brandy, was a upset winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies for Dwayne Lucas, I believe, a number of years ago. Take Charge Brandy, she's a half-sister to Omaha Beach. So, real real uh, strong, classy pedigree on the bottom side for Cravassier, and uh, like you said, Greg, he won that uh, mile and an eighth maiden race, so he's going to have no trouble going longer distances in the future. And we'll see. I thought that Unbridled Bomber had some traffic trouble in Upper Stretch. Um, there were some visibility issues for this race, so it's hard to see with some of the camera angles. But I thought uh, his rider maybe made the wrong choice to try to sneak up inside of the tiring Hagler at the quarter pole. Um, but like you said, he was getting a pace set up in his favor. So maybe that's mitigated. that mitigates the trouble if Eddie had a little bit. Yeah, and the one horse I think we can say just needs to stay sprinting is Hagler who actually went off three to one, I believe, second choice in this race, set that fast pace. And I think he'll do well on the turn back. But uh, let's let's stop with routing him because that, that's not going to work. Yeah, I agree. He's one that really wants to turn back in distance. A horse that was coming out of a fast sprint race, though, that was able to stretch out was the winner of the Mucho Macho Man at Gulfstream Simplification, who I believe had never gone farther than six furlongs in his career. But he stretched out to the mile here and had no trouble. To somewhat to my surprise, this race, though, it definitely played out in a manner a little bit different than it looked on paper, as they just let this horse get away through the opening quarter mile, and I think that really made a difference in the end. Yeah, it was a solid effort. I mean, he had run that huge maiden race back in October where he won by, I know it was more than 15 lengths, got a 99 time for him, U.S. speed figure. Then I'm not really sure what happened last time. I, I didn't get a chance to watch the replay of that race. You know, I wasn't handicapping these races, so I'm not sure what happened. There's some trouble comments about the start, and he just didn't run at all. And he kind of rebounded back to that maiden win. As you said, he didn't face a lot of pressure in this spot. It wasn't, uh, you know, the, the toughest test for him, but he did elevate his speed figure from that 99-2 back to a 106. Uh, he did have things his own way. Like you mentioned, uh, he was clear. We don't have it coded in blue, but the race changed from a 91 early and gradually improved all the way up to a 107 at the finish. So he couldn't have scripted it much better. 
yeah, if you compare this race to the cash run over the same distance for the three-year-old Phillies that we'll talk about a bit later, um, the opening quarters, there was a huge chasm between them, and Simplification just got things his own way for that first uh, two furlongs, and it really allowed him to get the distance in the end. Strike hard who finished second. He's a hard trier. I don't think he's going to be among the top three-year-olds in this division or even among the top three-year-olds in Florida over the next few months, but he just always runs his race. I just think he's going to find a few better than him as you have some horses that uh, come in for the East Coast or the I should say the Northeast based barns. We didn't really have any of those in this Mucho Macho Man, just graphic detail for Bill Mott, who uh, did not step forward off his debut effort. But simplification got the job done here. We'll see if he turns out to be a true ter- two turn router when the distances get longer in the future. Let's move on to some other tracks to talk about stakes races. We'll actually first go back to Santa Anita to wrap up their graded stakes action there from last Saturday. And Craig, the biggest speed figure that we saw all weekend was in another graded stakes on that Saturday card, where they also ran the sham in the La Kenyatta for the older Phillies and mares. And the Bob Baffert trained as time goes by, just really never had much competition in this race. Didn't seem like it on paper and certainly not on the racetrack. No, this was probably the race of the weekend. I mean, she was impressive. She got a 124 time form U.S. speed figure. And it wasn't one of those where she just went to an easy lead. She did sit off the uh, second choice a bit, uh, who was going pretty quick, 140 pace figures early. And she was able to sit right off her flank and just blue Park Avenue away turning for home. Uh, I guess a real disappointment in this race has to be Moonlight Dioro, who was one of the top three-year-old fillies early in that campaign and just hasn't developed at all, obviously had some issues, but hasn't come back the same. But as time goes by, when she's right, she can really run some races. She does seem to love Santa Anita. I know you were a fan of her last spring when she hit her best spot. She seemed to cool off a little over the summer when racing moved to Del Mar try to race in New York, but she ran that big race at Los Al last time and, and backed it up here. So she ran as fast as we saw the Phillies run, Phillies and Mares run all last year. So big effort from her. Yeah, I don't want to get too high on her for this performance. She's a horse that, like you said, I had thought had a lot of potential last winter when she was kind of breaking out with these kinds of speed figures, and she just never ascended to the top of the division when she faced the good horses. She kind of folded up, so I'm a little bit skeptical of her. She seems like the kind of horse that can run a big speed figure when she's facing inferior competition, but not so much when she really has to fight for it, so... I'm a little skeptical of her moving forward. She might collect some more graded stakes victories in California this winter if there is no competition. Um, But uh, I'd be skeptical of her if she steps up again against some of the top fillies and mares that are out there. And when you look through this field, Craig, there's just... There was just nothing behind her. I mean, Park Avenue coming out of, I believe, some allowance raises. She's she's okay, but I mean, she's not really a graded stakes horse. And like you said, the one other horse with graded stakes credentials, Moonlight Doro, she just has not come back as the same kind of runner, has not stepped forward since that promise that she showed early in her career. So um, this was this was a um, a glorified allowance race in some senses for uh, as time goes by. She'll face some tougher tasks in the future. Another graded stakes from last Saturday at Santa Anita was the Joe Hernandez grade two event going six and a half furlongs on that uh, new shoot at Santa Anita. Chewing Gum, a shipper from the East Coast for Bill Mott, got the job done here narrowly in a very rare victory for this horse. He's one that likes to settle for minor awards and the California betters didn't really go with him in this race, but he got the trip to get up to win by a nose. Yeah, this was an impressive performance. The one thing I will say is I'm going to have to go back and check the times of this because these fractions, to me, look a little bit fishy. Uh, It is it is the new shoot, as you say. They've went back to the beans at Santa Anita, but the shoot didn't have beans when uh, the, it didn't exist when they formerly had bean timing. So if these times are legit, and I'm not saying they're not, it's just one I definitely want to check out. Uh, It was impressive because this horse was well at the back of the pack. We have all the fractions coated in blue. The opening quarter was was over 23, 23-32, and he was able to just run them down. Uh, It was a really tight finish between him and Beer Can Man, who wound up going off the favorite in the race. Uh, But uh, 
just really impressive from chewing gum if legit. He gets a 118 time form US speed figure. Beer can man got a 115, which is pretty much what he always runs. So maybe uh, chewing gum just like those California courses a little bit more than he did back east. Yeah, I, I don't know what the run up is for these races. The times almost look as if they were timed with the run up included. Um, it's just, like you said, it's a little hard to believe that. Chewing gum was seven lengths back after a quarter in 23 and one. Um, that, that's extremely slow for that distance at Santa Anita. So we'll see if those do check out. I'm sure uh, Craig will time those from video posted on Twitter later. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Chewing gum, he ran his race. He's always been a good horse. He he got the trip that he needed here, saving ground and coming out in the stretch. Beer can man, I think a little over bet here to go off at even money. I, I wouldn't say that his prior speed figures or performance lines had really warranted that level of support. It's not like he had run faster or even really as fast as some other horses coming into this race. Um, so I think the betters just went a little bit overboard on a horse with uh, coming off a victory. Uh, but Chewing Gum, uh, good placement by Bill Mott to send this horse out to California and uh, get this grade two victory. Moving on to another turf race run at Santa Anita on Saturday, the grade three Robert J. Frankel for the Phillies and Mares. Uh, this division, Craig, never the toughest, uh, the Philly turf division out in California, but it seems like we've got at least a decent runner that's participating there now in Luck, who is coming off a couple of narrow losses in graded stakes races at the end of last year, but she was able to get to the winner's circle here and did so with a breakout performance. She was pretty impressive winning this race. Yeah, breakout's a pretty good word. That's what I was going to use. She's a horse who hadn't really put it all together uh, in her races since she shipped to the United States, but this was a pretty good effort. Uh, she got a 116, which isn't the greatest figure. I will say it was more visually impressive, the way she seemed to kind of have push-button speed when the, the jockey asked her to make her move on the turn. Um I don't want to be too fooled, though, and overrate this. It was just a grade three. That's the kind of figure that it got with a 116. And it was a perfect trip when you go back and watch. It was a great ride. She saved ground all the time, never found the straw on her path, and just had that long, clear, unimpeded run. So good effort. She's probably going to win some more stakes races out in Southern California, but I don't think I'd like her as much if she was shipping. Yeah, I mean, the uh, probably the leader of the division out there going to Vegas was not in this race. Um, she's always dangerous on the front end, but uh, the pace th this one did set up for luck, but she did come through with that really strong stretch run. So we'll see if she can maintain this level of performance or even move forward because she's a relatively lightly raced horse. I think she's only, I want to say she's only four years old. She might be five. I actually have to look that up. Um, but um, she is one that seems to be really moving forward now that, that she's uh, settled into California. So she is one that could do a lot of damage in this. This division moving forward. Before we move on from Santa Anita, Craig, just one more race to discuss. That was the first race on Friday. It's never a surprise when Bob Baffert sends out a debut winner or one that's visually impressive, and that was certainly the case with Distracted Princess. This race did take place on New Year's Eve, and she was a three-year-old then, so she is four years old now that we're recording this in 2022. So it took this one a long time to get to the races, but certainly won it the right way, winning by 13 lengths. Yeah, and it was no surprise. I think she wound up going off like one to five in this race. Uh, not sure. She obviously must have had some issues to have such a delayed debut, but she did everything right. I mean, she drew off through the stretch, got a 107 time form US speed figure. Final time is a 110. So she certainly has some ability and will be interesting to see where she shows up next. Uh, I'm not sure about the breeding. I, I would imagine she, to me, she looks more like a sprinter, but you obviously know more about that stuff than me. Be interested to hear your take. But in a division that wasn't super strong last year, uh, maybe she could make some noise if he's able to keep her together. Yeah, um, we'll see what they decide to do with her. It should be noted this. This was a terrible maiden field. I mean, she was bet down to one to five for a reason. Um, I think the one other horse that had form just didn't really do any running in this race. And uh, it, a lot of the horses that were coming in also were coming out of turf races, switching to dirt. So I, I question whether this was a, a real maiden special weight that she won. I think the margin of victory 
very exaggerated and she got that slow pace. So I question how good this horse actually is. She had a lot working in her favor here. Um, and uh, these Bob Baffert horses, he sent out a slew of these debut winners so far at the Santa Anita meet. So I'll be interested to see how they run back in the next month. Bob Baffert off to a very hot start at Santa Anita. Um, Distracted Princess, uh, she is by, I think, Distorted Humor, her damn Celtic princess. She was a very good horse in Brazil when she started her career. I think she won a bunch of turf races. She eventually got to uh, California, and I think she was grade one placed on the turf. So a lot of turf breeding on the damn side. We'll see where they ultimately go with her, but uh, she's one that I would view with a little bit of skepticism down the line when she faces another good horse. Yeah, as you were talking, I look, it was only four horses. There was one other first-time starter, and the other two had never stepped foot on dirt. Let's move on to Gulfstream Park to talk about a couple more of their stakes races there from New Year's Day last Saturday. We already mentioned the Mucho Macho Man, the three-year-old Philly version of that race. The cash run was won impressively by Kathleen O, oh, who is now two for two in her career for Suge McGahee, a horse that... Unlike many uh, young horses that uh, make their debuts and come back for their second starts, just seems to have this established running style where she wants to drop way out of the, at the out the back of the pack and make this looping run around the far turn to take over. Um, it worked here, but I think that was largely due to the fast pace. Yeah, first, before we get started on the races, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for not having any of the turf stakes on here uh, <laughs> from Golf Street. I did to that favor. I'm sure we're going to, yeah, I'm sure we'll have to deal with that issue in coming weeks as, as there doesn't seem to be much help on the horizon. But the dirt races are actually being timed correctly, so I, I'm happy to talk about those Uh Kathleen O was pretty impressive to me. She only got a 94 time form US speed figure, which on the face of it, nothing special. She did improve from, I think it was an 86 first time out. But when you watch the race, she really got wiped out at the start. There was some trouble. She kind of got slammed into. Her running style is as a, a dead closer for sure, based on these two runs. But I do think she was a lot further back than she needed to be. And what impressed me the most was how quickly she was able to get into a striking position. Uh, as they were moving into the turn of the one-mile race, she was already looking like the winner to me. So I thought it was a good race. It's one where I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to the speed figure. I, I think she could have easily ran triple digits with a better break, uh, despite being a deep closer. So she's one with some talent for sure, in my opinion. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what happens with her. Um, she's definitely in the right barn with the Shug McGahee. You can have that expectation that she will continue to move forward in subsequent starts. We don't always see these Shug runners that win their debuts come right back to win their second starts, and she did so very impressively. Um, she... I, I wonder if eventually that tendency to drop way out the back of the pack and to break slowly will catch up with her. It's worked out for her in a couple of sprint races that have featured, or I should say one turn races that have featured relatively honest to fast paces uh, in a longer race with a more moderate pace that could really work against her. So we'll see what happens with her running style moving forward. Uh, but she definitely is one that just kind of falls out of the gate and takes a while to get into stride. Uh, this race was oddly bet to me, uh, Surreal Fantasy, who was the morning line favorite and looked like one that would take most of the money coming off a huge speed figure win at Tampa, um, was just dead on the board and ran to that money because she had none of her typical early speed and faded to finish last. So that was a little curious. Um, but uh, I guess it made the race somewhat easier for Kathleen O, but she still was a visually impressive winner. So I'll be interested to see where she goes in the future. Yeah, you make some good points. While I was impressed, she's never the kind of horse that I, I'm excited to bet because she's going to take money going forward. She's always going to drop back. So it, it's kind of a conundrum for me. I, I do think she's a talented filly, but she's going to get over bet going forward because of the connections and because of the two for two. So she'll be one to watch. I, I'll probably be silly enough to bet against her. We'll, we'll see how the field shapes up. And I'm sure at some point, we're going to talk about her on a forecast coming up. 
One more race to mention from Gulfstream, as we will skip over those turf races, was the uh, dirt sprint stakes that they ran the Limehouse for the three-year-olds. And I thought this was a pretty nice battle, Craig, between Lightning Larry and Over Revolution. Um, Over Revolution was the favorite in this race, I believe, for Safi Joseph. And looked like he had worked out a perfect trip coming to the top of the stretch. But I was impressed with the grit uh, that Lightning Larry showed to battle back on the inside and fend him off. And this was a reasonably fast race. Yeah, it was game as could be. Uh, he set a solid pace. He faced some pressure from a different rival earlier on, uh, Concrete Glory, who was, you know, bad. It's not like he was some long, hopeless long shot in here. He gave Lightning Larry a, 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 a battle early. It, it looked like of a revolution was just sitting off of him and ready to pounce. And he just couldn't get there. So Lightning Larry, it was a good run from him. I, I was particularly impressed. He seems to be getting better and better. This was already his seventh lifetime start on just the first day of his three-year-old season. So he's obviously a tough horse. He's game. So look forward to seeing him show up in a sprint somewhere. A couple more races to discuss as we travel to venues that we haven't yet mentioned. Uh, one of those is Turfway Park on the synthetic course there. They ran the Holiday Cheer on New Year's Day Saturday. And, Craig, this produced the highest sprint speed figure of the past weekend as Sir Alfred James got a 120 time form U.S. speed figure for this six and a quarter length victory. This is a horse who's been uh, very active over the past uh, three months or so for his trainer, uh, Norman Cash. But... When he delivers, he's pretty good. Yeah, he was a horse who was claimed for 62.5 uh, back at, I think it was Keeneland or Churchill, somewhere over this fall. And he's just been running and running. He's a six-year-old gelding. He obviously loves to run. And he had just been uh, getting into some good form. What I found interesting was this was his first time to ever run on this synthetic surface. Uh, and he handled it well. He's run well on turf uh, at least once in his career, so he seems to handle everything. But this was a dominant performance. I mean, he won by eight lengths, I believe. He was set a pretty quick pace and just drew away from the field. So I'm not sure what the future holds for him, but he seems to be in career best form right now. Yeah, it seemed maybe three back in that full highlight, like maybe he was falling apart after having been so active in the month of November, but he got right back on track at Oaklawn two back and uh, getting on the synthetic surface here, it really seemed to work for him in this holiday cheer. Um, interesting fact about him, he actually is a half brother to, to Gets to got Stormy, that very good Mark Cassie trained turf mare who won the four star Dave a couple of times. So, um, Maybe the synthetic and the turf surfaces, they actually do work well for him. He hasn't been on turf in a very long time. He tried it early in his career, um, but he certainly moved forward off his recent dirt form, getting on the Tapita surface at Turfway Park on Saturday. So, yeah, a, a really impressive effort. He went fast early. He went fast late. This speed figure totally checked out for the runners in behind him. So um, just a big performance from uh, Sir Alfred James. One more race to discuss uh, as we move down south to Fairgrounds, Craig, on Sunday. One that I admit I have not seen the speed figure yet, um, but uh, we should note the return of Obesos, the fifth place finisher from last year's Kentucky Derby. He made his four-year-old debut this past Sunday, winning a mile in a 16th race at the Fairgrounds on the dirt. Uh, this was a pretty game effort for him. He had to battle with Intrepid Heart down to the wire, but he was just able to get his nose down first. Yeah, this was one I, I mentioned. I watched the replays. I, I recommend our listeners, if they have access to it, go ahead and watch this one because this was an exciting race to watch. I, I didn't know who won even when they crossed the wire. So it, it was a good effort from Obesos. I don't have the official speed figure yet. I believe it's going to be about 112, which is about what he was running as a three-year-old. But this was his first race in almost seven months away. I would assume there's going to be room to improve all the, off of this. If I was to, to bet him back in next his next race, I would expect him to run closer to a 120 than a 112. So I was impressed. Good effort from him. He, he did get a nice trip inside. He saved a lot of ground, but it's what you want to see in a return race. 
I maintain with this horse that I want to see him running around one turn. I said that last year. Uh, I know we ran well in the Kentucky Derby going a mile and a quarter, and they're just sticking with two turn races. I really think this horse uh, wants to get turned back in distance. We saw that impressive turn of foot that he possesses around the far turn in this race where he made that quick rush to the lead, and he, he got a little bit leg weary late. I mean, I like that he was game to hold off Intrepid Heart to the wire, but I really think this horse has the turn of foot of a one turn horse, and I like to see them try that. It's some point because horses like him that are deep closers you tend to get more pace to close into in those shorter races and i think he's got the uh the speed to handle it but we'll see what they decide to do with him from here just nice to see him get back on the board because often these horses that run the kentucky derby um you don't see them get back to their form or you never see them again so it's just nice to see obesos getting started again yeah i was going to make the same point I, I knew you had thought that in the past that he's more of a one-turn horse the way he got a little leg weary, I mean, with a furlong to go, it looked like he was going to win this race by four or five lengths. And, you know, maybe some of it was a layoff, but I tend to agree with you. I don't think he's a horse who's going to want to go a mile and an eighth against top comp top competition. I do want to mention the real disappointment in here, and I believe he fav uh, finished last, was Math Wizard, who won the Pennsylvania Derby a few years back. Uh, he's now a six-year-old, so it's obviously been a little while, but he just did no running whatsoever. He was coming off a layoff, so I just hate to see a horse who was so good at one time run the way he did on Saturday, and I hope they either figure out what's going on with him or, or give him you know, the rest that he deserves. Well, that's all the racing to recap for this week. Craig, glad to have you back, and we'll have you back again for the forecast. We record that a little bit later this week. I have not looked too far ahead of the stake schedule to see what's on tap for the upcoming weekend. I, I think it's the Tropical Turf at Gulfstream, a uh, grade three event going a mile. Uh, not sure what's going on out in California, but we'll find something to talk about. Oaklawn usually has good Saturday cards, so we'll look around the country and find a sequence that uh, will be worth discussing on the forecast on Friday. Sounds good. And I do want to put one note before we go. Uh, we were talking about that Joe Hernandez stakes. Uh, I pulled up the track as times and let's just say they are vastly different from what's in the chart. So I'm going to do some inquiring about that. It, it was obviously a much faster race early. Those, those posted times make no sense. So I'll get in touch with the people at Aquabase who have some connections at Santa Anita and find out what's going on there because yeah, we can't have times that bad showing up for our big stakes races. Well, yeah, it looks suspicious, so glad you're on the case, and uh, we'll we'll stay tuned for that. Uh, Craig, thanks for uh, coming back and uh, doing this podcast again. Glad to have you back, I should say. Uh, and remember, you can always hear these podcasts on DRF.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Wherever you get your podcast, just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Thanks for tuning in this week, everybody, and make sure to catch that Time Form US forecast coming up on Friday.